to the clinical podcast series brought to you by the American Academy of Optometry Foundation. Today's episode is entitled Homonymous Visual Field Defect and Retinal Thinning After Occipital Stroke. Our host today is Dr. Mila Bruchik and our topical expert is Dr. Michael Gerstner. Our topical editor is Dr. Katherine Hogan. Now it is my pleasure to bring you today's episode. Hi everyone, I'm Dr. Mila Brujic and I'm joined with Dr. Michael Gerstner from the Southern College of Optometry. Dr. Gerstner, if you could give us just a little bit of a background on yourself, please. Sure, yeah, um, I'm, on, I'm on faculty here at Southern College of Optometry. I'm a professor. Uh, my primary role at, at Southern College of Optometry is I am the chief of service for our advanced care department. That's our acute care and our chronic care. I also teach a, uh, our first insult, installment of our retina course, uh, which is a second year course. And then I also have a private practice here in Memphis called Midtown Eye Care. That's great, Michael. Now, you have a really interesting article that you're going to share with us. So can you share with us the title and why the topic of this is important to most ODs? Yeah, the, the title of the paper is Homonymous Visual Field Defect and Retinal Thinning After Occipital Stroke. And what's interesting about the, about the article is we have a set of patients and what we find with that set of patients that had stroke, they were evaluated approximately a week after the occipital stroke that about 70% of those patients presented with a classic, you know, visual field defect that, that you would expect when you have an occipital stroke. Of those patients that had that stroke, half of them uh, went on to continue to have a visual field defect a year after the initial stroke. And half of those patients that originally had that uh, visual field defect from the stroke, that visual field defect resolved. But the, the crux of the study is that an OCT, an optic nerve, RNFL OCT was done, a macula OCT of the ganglion cell and IPL was done a year after that stroke. And what we would find is that the patients that had the visual field defect one year after the stroke, they would have thinning consistent on that OCT. The patients that presented with stroke originally and then resolved over that year period did not have, a, have any visual field defect at that one year um, follow-up visit. They did not have any RNFL or ganglion cell thinning or IPL thinning at that one year follow-up. So that's, that's interesting. And I mean, again, it shows how important the whole visual pathway is to even leading up to, to the globe itself and the RNFL and the essentially the ganglion cell complex. Um, how, can, how can clinicians utilize this information? Like when you read something like this, what, what's the usefulness to us in our clinical practices here moving forward? Well, I think the, the key takeaway uh, the take home points, the key points that we are going to be able to, to see is that when we do look at that, that RNFL and that ganglion cell IPL at that one year, is that the pattern of that thinning is going to be very specific. Um, so we are going to find that the, the um, RNFL superior and inferior area of that optic nerve, that's where we are gonna find that thinning, which is different than what you would find, for example, with a patient that had optic neuritis with MS, you would expect there to be a temporal um, RNFL thinning. Mm -hmm. But we also tend to find that with that ganglion cell or that IPL, is that those patients will prevent, uh, present with diffuse really two different ways, diffuse thinning, or again, they'll have that homonymous thinning that will correlate very nicely with the visual field defect. So it's very predictable. So is there anything um, directly to, from a patient's perspective that they need to be educated on about these findings or anything that's applicable to them specifically? 
Yeah, and I think, of course, that's very important because when it comes to patient education, you want to base your decisions on fact and you want to follow that evidence-based medicine, of course. And if a patient presents with that visual field defect after having that stroke, let's say a week after the stroke, you evaluate them, you note that they have a visual field defect, I think you can have that, that discussion with that patient that 50% of the time, that visual field defect will resolve completely at that one year follow-up, according to this particular study. But I think what's even more important is that when you do see them at that one year follow-up and you are able to do your OCT, RNFL, ganglion cell, and then IPL, is that if that patient has that thinning that correlates with that visual field, you can at least be able to say or educate that patient that things are going to be stable, that you don't expect that visual field or that RNFL thinning to worsen over time. So if they do have a visual field defect, well then perhaps we can move them into another direction like low vision services or some other type of therapy in order to help them manage their day-to-day -day, um, activities. And if you find that a patient that had a stroke originally after that, or I'm sorry, visual field defect after the stroke, and then that visual field defect resolved over that one year period, and you do that RNFL, ganglion cell, IPL, you find that they do not have any thinning, then you can be pretty confident that you don't expect them to have any visual field issues moving forward at that point. That's great. Out of curiosity, um, do you know how, how soon after these these stroke events, if the patient is going to have a permanent visual field defect, how soon you start seeing it translated into the anatomy of the RNFL and, yeah. the, and the GCC? Well, the, the study um, was only done to where you had that RNFL ganglion cell done one year after the, the original stroke. But other studies will show you that the visual field defect will begin to resolve within three to six months after that initial insult um, to the occipital lobe. That's great, Michael. So, so first and foremost, thank you. I think you so eloquently, eloquently just tied everything together with this article and really made it clinically relevant as well too. I want to thank you. We're definitely going to have you back for another episode on the podcast and thank you all for joining us as well. Thank you. And a special thanks to Cooper Vision for their educational grant to make it all happen.